folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. This caught my eye. Uh, pulled up the Drudge Report. I come in here every day, I pull up some news, we'll see what's going on in the world. After all, this is a Watchman ministry. A lot of you out there are helping us watch. You're also watchers. You're on the wall watching out for what's going on. I'm going to show you how important that is here in just a few minutes, and it's related to this. But I come in, I come in the other day. And I've just pulled up the Drudge Report, and this is what I saw. Drudge Report, up from the ruins. And it has a, it has a picture here of, uh, if you look very, very deep in the background, you see a tall building. Now, that's the Empire State Building. In the foreground is the new world trade tower that they're building and uh, the date of this in fact uh, let's let's look at the article WTC's freedom tower to rise higher than the Empire State Building today now let me let me just cut let me just kind of tell you why this caught my eye number one uh, the symbolism of this tower we're going to look at it here in a little bit but the date that this particular thing happened, let, let's go back to the article. Uh, and, and what happened is, is that they were able to, they were able to make the world, the, the World Trade Tower, the one they're building, to replace the other two that fell down into a crumpled heap. I want you to think about that. Because the Drudge Report headline was, Up From the Ruins. That means something. And I'm going to show you what it means. But on this particular date, April 30th, and you say, well, what's the big idea about April 30th, April Schmertieth? Who cares? Well, that's the day before May the 1st. And you're going, oh, okay, now May the 1st. I get May the 1st because that's the day the Illuminati was formed. We'll talk about that too in a, in a minute. There is actually a, a particular reason why Adam Weishaupt formed the Order of the Illuminati. Actually, it goes by another name. We'll tell you what that is in a minute. There is an, a very important reason why Adam Weishaupt picked that particular day, and I'll show you why. But you need to remember something. This year was a leap year. So there was an extra day added into February. And again, I'm going to show you what all that means here in a minute. But look at this. So on April the 30th, in fact, if I look at the bottom here, the owners of One World Trade Center, look at the name, which will surpass the height of the Empire State Building today, are waging an all-out business war against its midtown cousin, uh, the Post has learned. So why is it that this made such big news? Why, and I want you to understand, why is it that on this particular day, April the 30th, did, uh, did they have to report, and there was an idea that we have to make this building make headlines today by making it actually taller than the Empire State Building. So what happens is that in September 11, 2001, when the world, both World Trade Center's towers fell, along with Building 7, and nobody still knows why Building 7 fell down, but it did, okay? We don't know why. But anyway, both World Trade Towers fell down to the ground. And so that made, and I remember hearing that on the news today, on that day, that that actually made the Empire State Building, once again, the tallest building in New York City. Okay, so they enjoyed that for a while. Now, on this particular day, 11 years after, well, almost 11 years, not quite yet, but almost 11 years after uh, 2001, we have the, the new, there's, there's one tower going up, and the, it's supposed to be a certain height, it's not there yet, but actually on April the 30th, this tower reached, uh, they put like a beam in place, like one beam, big deal. They put a beam in place that actually then made the One World Trade Tower taller than the Empire State Building. So now it, it goes in the record book, okay, on this particular date. I, I'm going to kind of teach you the, the language of symbols. You know that I, uh, I really dig symbols, okay, like this one here. We're going to talk about this one actually today here in a little bit, if we get time. Um, 
Anyway, I, I, the language of symbols. Why this, why this building? Why does it look the way that it does? Why is it going to be as tall as it is? Why does it have to reach a certain height on a certain day? Why April 30th? Let's look at the symbolism of the tower. Some of this goes back to a couple of videos that we did. One was called the Babel Conspiracy. Uh, the other one was called the Beast of 9-11. But I'm going I'm to kind of throw some new things in with you so that we get a little bit more understanding. Then we'll talk about the role of a watchman in relation to this. You're going to see this. Uh, first of all, let's go. Let's look in the occult world because in the occult realm, they love to use symbols. Symbols, symbols, symbols. Why? Because symbols mean something. They mean something on the outside. There's an exoteric meaning to a symbol. In other words, um, uh, Thomas Nelson, they'll put this little symbol on front of the New King James Bible and they'll say, that, see, that simply means the Trinity. Not really, because the Bible, of the inside, the Bible says that we're not to think that the Godhead can be graven with art and man's device. And so God said, there is no symbol for the Trinity. Thomas Nelson said, oh yeah, it's a symbol for the Trinity. Somebody's not telling the truth, and I, can, I guarantee you it's not God. Okay? God, is, God is telling the truth here. So symbols have an exoteric meaning, and then they have an esoteric meaning, which means secret, hidden. It's something that they're not going to reveal. But I believe, I believe in a God and a Bible that reveals the deep and secret things. That's what he said in the book of Daniel. So the symbolism of the tower, according to the occult realm, we have a tarot card. Tarot cards are all about the, uh, the transformation of man or the future of man. Tarot card readers will lay out cards and say, this is your future. Actually, the entire deck of tarot cards uh, predicts the future of mankind and how mankind is going to be transformed from a lower state to a God state, just like the devil promised in Genesis chapter 3. So here is the, here's the tarot card of the tower. And I want you to notice this. This is, this is really interesting. We have a tower, okay? And the tower is built by mankind, and then something happens. Something happens. And I want you to notice that above this tower, there's a crown. Now, stop right here. Let's, let's think about it. Some of this is real obvious if you just stop and think about it. A crown denotes a king. So this tower represents, oh, I'm going to turn there already, represents a king. Revelation 9.11. Think about that. Revelation 9.11, the Bible says, and they had a king over them. Who is, who is they? It's that scorpion locust devils that are being released out of the bottomless pit. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. This king, his, his name is Apollyon, which means destroyer or destruction, or Abaddon, which means destroyer or destruction. Okay, what happened? 9-11. <laughs> destruction. So look at this card again. We have, a, we have the tower with a crown on it. Okay, And the tower is being struck by lightning and flames and you have people falling out of windows and the tower catches on fire and it falls to the ground. That's exactly what happened September 11, 2001 with those two towers. They were struck, fire, people falling out of the windows, they crumpled down to the ground and they represent a king. Now this king, according to Revelation chapter 9, the beast, He's going to rise up again. And Revelation 17 tells us something interesting about the beast is that there were five, there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And the beast is of is the eighth and is of the seven. So this idea, here's this tower, and here, or let's say the two the two world trade towers, okay? Symbolized by the tower, tower tarot card. The uh, the towers fall, the king has fallen. The king has been, uh, he's been toppled, as it were. So that was, the, that was the imagery that we got September 11th, 2000, or 9-11. That was the imagery that we got, okay? But here's the real meaning of the tower. We look at it again. Uh, even though uh, it is struck down and the king has fallen and the tower falls and people falls and there's flames and all this stuff. Now, think about... Think about when the uh, think about the abyss or the bottomless pit. It's referred to as the prison or hell in the Bible. 
and it has flames, okay? So I want you to understand this. We have the flames, we have the rubble. Uh, literally, if you remember on that day, the, the two towers literally disintegrated into ashes and dust. They were, they were hauling off a major portion of the World Trade Tower, not with huge cranes, but one shovel at a time, one bucket full of, at a time, is full of ashes, debris, human remains. What it, we will never forget where we were on that day. But it was meant to in, put an image into our minds, the image, the imagery of symbolism. And so the king is fallen, representing by the towers falling down. But they're building a new one up in its place. I want you to look at the imagery of the phoenix now, the phoenix bird. The phoenix uh, has this mythological bird. Okay, I want you to think of a creature with wings. Okay, if you look in Revelation chapter 9, you'll notice that these locusts or these scorpions, uh, they have wings and the wings sound like chariots. Okay. And I want you to get that here. We have a mythological bird, uh, and every culture in the world has some idea of the Phoenix. The Phoenix dives or is cast into the fire. Okay. Then it rises back up out of the ashes. If we go back to this, this headline from Drudge Report up from the ruins, that's the imagery that we're supposed to get. That's what we're supposed to be seeing here. We have a new tower rising up from the ashes of where the old two towers once stood. Do you understand that? That building, that, that building there in Manhattan is a phoenix. It represents a king. It represents a king that used to be and is in the flames and being destroyed in the ashes and now is rising up from the very ashes and the very place that it was once destroyed. That's the symbolism of what all this is going on. Somebody sent me this, and I remember seeing this a long time ago, and it just clicked in my memory. Back in 1998, uh, a magazine called The Economist came out, 19, excuse me, 1988, and it said, get ready for world currency. And this was the euro uh, or a prediction of the euro. And I want you to notice here we have a phoenix. kind of looks like an eagle, doesn't it? Stop right here. What's on the back of the $1 bill? It's an eagle. Okay, But Manly Hall and all the occultists say, well, you say eagle, we say phoenix because that's what it is. Okay, The eagle is actually a phoenix and it has something to do with rebirth or regeneration, the birth of a new world order as it were. So here we have the phoenix rising up out of the ashes. I want you to notice what the ashes are. The ashes are the old currency of Europe. And that, that eagle or that phoenix bears a, uh, a coin on its chest that has the number 10 on it. Boy, let's think about this for a minute. I mean, let's just break this down and understand the language of symbolism. It's right there in front of your face. The beast that rises up out of the sea, guess what it has? It has seven heads, but it has 10 horns, and those horns represent kings. It represents dominion. And so here we have the European Union and the euro rising up, being predicted as far back as 1988. They're saying, get ready for it. In fact, don't just get ready for the euro. Get ready for a world currency. In other words, every nation in the world using one common currency. What does that have to do with anything prophetically? Well, we know in Revelation chapter 13 that the, the false prophet causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead so that no man might buy or sell. So absolutely, absolutely, the economy... Um, financial matters, uh, the world markets, the currency of the world, the gold at the market, everything has to do with the end times prophecy of the beast rising up out of the sea and what's going to happen on the earth during those days. And I can tell you that, and I want you to understand this. It, let's go to this image of Baphomet. Okay, here is Baphomet, and he's doing this. He's making the little hand gestures, and he's 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 all symbolic, is what he is. And on this arm, he's got salve written. You know what that means? Dissolve. Let's dissolve it. Think of the two towers coming down, and the ashes and dust, and that's really all it is. Dissolve the old, and then on this arm it says coagula, which means coagulate or Form it back together in a, in a new model. So solve a coagula. Let's tear it all down first. Burn it up. 
and then let's coagulate it again. Let's bring it back up piece by piece. Let's rebuild it, as it were. So that's the imagery here. Look back at The Economist, okay? So we have uh, the phoenix rising up out of the ashes of all the world's currency. And I want you all to look at what he's got on his head. He's got a crown on his head, but it's a funny-looking crown. It's a fleur-de-lis, okay? Well, let me, let me get a, a better, better image of this here. Oh, by the way, speaking of uh, eagles and crowns, this is uh, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. You know, I always keep these books up here for illustration. And here we have on the front of this, we have a double-headed eagle, and it's got a crown on it. Okay, that denotes a king that's going to rise up one of these days. That's what that is. But this fleur-de-lis symbol, I want you to notice that it has two sort of lesser petals, and it has one giant one sticking up out of the middle. That is this symbol here, the symbol of the tricatra, and it represents something. We're going to talk about that in a minute, so just bear with me. Okay, This is Symbolism 101 here. This I'm teaching you how to read symbols based upon the language of the Scripture, the fact that God reveals everything. So we have, uh, we have a king, we have a phoenix rising up, there's his ten kings there, there's the financial mess that the world is in right now. Okay? And everybody in the world is calling for, oh, we've got to have a global currency. We've got to have this. got to have that. Okay? So mark it down. You, you understand now what's going on. Okay? Towers come. By the way, it's the world trade. You know what trading is? Buying and selling. Okay? That's what it is. That was a signal that, the, that we're, we're, we're moving into a time where the old structures, the old currencies, the old ways, the old governments, the old the old Christian, the old Bible, okay? We don't want the old King James. We want a new one, okay? Everything old is being disintegrated, destroyed, burnt, down to ashes, so that we can build a new one in its place. What has happened? What has happened in churches? Even, even what used to be fundamental churches, what happened? Okay? They, were, they were always on the King James Bible. Okay? Something changed. Very subtly. Well, we use the New King, new King James. Same. It's the same. It's not saying anything that really, really... So if you're looking in the King James and you find the word hell all these places, then you look in the New King James and you don't find the word hell. I mean, it's in there just not as often, like 22 times less in this Bible that you'll find it there. Something, it's not the same. It's different. A new one has replaced it. It's in its place is what it is. Okay, so just think about the imagery of all this, and it's it's going on right in front of our very eyes. Okay, now, why does this have to happen? Why is it that the 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 new the one world trade tower has to make news headlines on on this particular day? Why does that have to happen? Well, remember, uh, I mentioned that uh, May first, May first, on on a normal calendar, would represent the 121st day of the year. Okay, that's what it would that's what it would represent. Now what is that what in the world is that? Okay. That breaks down to 11 times 11. We're going to see the symbolism very quickly of the number 11. Think of 911. Think of Revelation 9 verse 11. I mean, think about that. Think about the, that concept right there, the imagery of the number 11. Tower of Babel. Okay, Tower of Babel. Think about that. So May 1st would be, in a normal calendar year, the 121st day of the year, but not this year. This year, leap year, we added, stuck another day into February, and so now that puts everything ahead. So instead of May 1st being the 121st day of the year, in fact, let's go back for a second. We can look at, let's see, Barack Hussein came out last year and said, oh, we killed Obama. Okay, we got him. He's dead. He announced it. They killed him days before. He announced it May 1st. Okay, May 1st, 121st day of the year. George Bush, okay, does the same thing. Flies out, and you remember on that aircraft carrier, flies out on May 1st, stands there and says, yeah, we won the war in Iraq. Okay, we got him. Okay, well, that was a little premature, wasn't it? Okay, but it had to be on that, that particular day. Day, the 121st day of the year. So April 30th, 121st day of the year this year. That's 11 times 11. We mentioned Adam Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt was, uh, oh, he was a Jesuit priest, Roman Catholic. You know, the good guys, right? 
Okay, Jesuits are the like the uh, CIA of the Vatican. They know all and see all. Okay, that's their job. Their job, they have an agenda, and it's not to make everybody in the world a good Christian. Their job is to grab as much power as they humanly can and not stop until the entire world is ruled over by Rome. That's their, I mean, that's their job. That's what Ignatius de Loyola started. So here we have a, a Bavarian Jesuit priest by the name of Adam Weishaupt. Okay, so he's Bavarian, so he's Adam Weishaupt. And Adam Weishaupt started an organization called the Order of the Illuminati, or which the Illuminati simply means we've been illuminated. Okay, we see the light. It's not the light of the gospel. It's an angel of light, someone who is appearing as an angel of light. So their illumination does not come from God. It comes from Lucifer, the illuminated one. Okay, that's that's where it comes from. The light bearer. So Weishaupt forms the Order of the Illuminati, or actually it's referred to as the Order of Perfectibilists. That's a big word. What does it mean? Perfectibilists. The Order of Perfectibilists was basically like this. We think that mankind can do better. We think that we think there's a hidden potential in all of us that can rise up out of the deep, dark recesses of our inner being and come to new life. We think, we think actually man can become perfect. We think man can become God and never, and never die again, never have another disease and never have any sickness and actually have superpower. That's what the Order of Perfectibilists was all about. It's about bringing about a situation on earth where mankind realizes and actually becomes his own God. Jesuit priests did that. Okay? And uh, everybody says, well, you know, didn't last long, blah, blah. Oh, no, no, no. The principles of the Illuminati or the Order of Perfectibilists have infiltrated. Everybody says, well, it went into Freemasonry. Well, yeah, it did. But then it went a lot of other places, too. It's right now, according to Marilyn Ferguson, the Aquarian Conspiracy, she says, we, we, we're everywhere. We're in all the churches and all the Bible colleges and all the educational institutions. We're in all the businesses, governments. We're at the bank. We're at the supermarket. We're in uh, the uh, commercial people, the people that make commercials and advertise it. We're everywhere. We got our people everywhere. So this concept has just moved out, and it's covering the entire world right now. What year was that? May 1st, 1776. Now we look at another un- a building rising up now. It's the unfinished pyramid on the back of the $1 bill. It says Anuit Coeptus, which means he favors the birth the birth, a novus ordo seclorum, or a new world order, is what that means. And look on the bottom of that pyramid. MCC, or yeah, 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 MDCCLXXVI. That's a funny word. Okay, that's how you pronounce it. Okay, um, it's actually a number. It's Roman numerals, and the number is 1776. Oh, look, that. well, that has everything to do with the... Uh, the formation of our country, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. I do know that on the 121st day of the year, Adam Weishaupt formed in 1776 the Order of the Illuminati, the Perfectibilist. And it's all about bringing up out of the ashes of dead mankind a new world order. Something is rising up. And it's unfinished yet, but it's it's being worked on right now. It's being built... And being worked on right now. That's the symbolism. So, we go back to the Freedom Tower. Okay? We go back to the Freedom Tower. The goal is to make this building 1,776 feet tall exactly. Okay? Now, they're going to do this by way of putting a radio antenna up on top of it in order to reach that exact height. It's kind of like cheating. Okay, it really is only this tall, but if we stick this big antenna up on it, it's going to make it 1,776 feet tall. That's the goal. That number matches what's on the bottom of this pyramid, which is the same year that Adam Weishaupt formed the Order of the Illuminati on the 121st year, which happens day of the year, which happens to be the exact day that now the Freedom Tower is back in the news as being the once again its king of all the bill. Get it? Get it? 
It used to be, on September 11, 2001, it used to be the king of all the buildings in New York City, but it was cast down. Now, on the 121st day of the year, on this exact day, now it's back as the king of all the buildings in New York City. Do you, do you get it? Okay, and let me just explain, and you're, and you're going, oh, come on. You mean those workers and those architects and the crane operators and the, and the, uh, the outfitters and everybody else, the iron workers, everybody, they all gathered together in the huddle and they said, listen, when we build this thing, we need to make sure that this thing rises up above the Empire State Building on exactly April 30th, 2012. Everybody, are we in? Yeah, no, shh. Don't tell anybody. It's a secret. Oh, no. That didn't happen. It didn't happen. Okay? This is why conspiracy ideas don't make sense to some people. They say, are you kidding me? That many people could not be in collusion together and nobody's saying a word about it. That's insane. You're right. Because a real conspiracy at its core, it involves humans but it doesn't originate from them. It originates from spirits, conspiracy. It originates from spirits. They're the ones that are in charge. There is a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of devils. Uh, and I, I, something else I just want to throw at you real quickly. I want you to look at this. Look at, look at the graphic of the Freedom Tower. And I want you to notice the design of it. Looks, looks kind of weird. Okay, If you just look real closely at it, what you'll see is that you'll see a very long, thin triangle pointing upward. And then next to it, you'll see a very long, thin triangle pointing downward. And that's the design of the building. There's a triangle pointing upward, triangle, and it's like that. There's two of those per side of the building. It's four sides of the building. So there's, there's eight of those all together. Now, that number in itself is interesting because, remember, the beast that was and is not and shall be he is, he is the eighth and is of the seven. Think about it because there, are, there were actually seven buildings in the World Trade Center complex. Building seven also collapsed. Nobody knows why, but it did. Okay, So he is, he is the eighth and is of the seven. And that's that complex there. So we have this building. It's got eight little triangles, some four of them pointing up. And four of them pointing down. If you look at this symbol of a hexagram, what do you see? You see a triangle pointing down and a triangle pointing up. What does that mean? Let's look at, um, let's go over here to Genesis chapter 7. Because Jesus told us, as it was in the days of Noah, um, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Okay. So we look in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Verse 11, In the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day where the fountains of the great deep opened up and the windows of heaven were open. Stop right here. Okay, look at this. Okay, The fountains of the great deep were opened up. They, they, they shot up this way. And then the windows of heaven were open, and the rain shot down this way. Do you see it now? Okay, Pointing up and pointing down. That's the, that's the concept in the occult world in Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, that term even shows up in the Message Bible, where in the King James it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Message Bible uses this occult phrase, As above, as above, so below. That's the meaning of it. If you were to take that then, Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes, guess what's going to happen? Beasts are going to rise up out of the depths of the earth, and angels are going to fall down from the heavens. Do you get it now? But not only that, this, this layout of this building with the triangle pointing up and the triangle pointing down actually recorded for us in Daniel chapter 2, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. The vision that Nebuchadnezzar had had everything to do with a, a kingdom that's going to come. Remember a king. Okay? A kingdom that's going to come in the last days. And in Daniel chapter 2, we have part of this kingdom is toes. How many of them? 10. What number was on the chest of that phoenix rising up out of the flames? 10. Same thing. Same concept here. 10 kings. Dominion. That's what the number 10 represents. It represents dominion. The law 
represented by Ten Commandments, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So anyway... So we have uh, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So we have a mingling here. We have men, which represent below, and we have these, this fourth kingdom, which represents the evil angels, and they're mingling themselves with the seed of men. That's the symbolism of this building right here. Okay, It's all about building, building. Building the new world order. Putting together the... You remember the video we did called The Missing Piece. Putting together the missing piece of the Antichrist. That's what, that's what a tower is. The, remember the, what the missing piece is. The missing piece, when Isis started... Remember, her husband, Osiris, the sun god, was all chopped up in 14 pieces. She found 13 of them. Stuck them all back together. But there was, there was one piece missing. Okay, It was his privy member. His phallus. That's the symbolism of a tower, by the way. It's a giant phallus. It's what it is. And mankind is rebuilding this thing right now. The symbolism number of the number 11. Let's look in Genesis chapter 11. This is where we're going to get our understanding from. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. That would be Sumeria. And they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone. I want you to notice this. Brick for stone. They had slime for mortar. And I want to stop right here. What, what construction trade works with bricks? Okay? Let's think about that. They had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name. There it is right there. A name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And there you have the, the famous Tower of Babel. It's, it was, they actually, when, when God came down upon this situation, saw what they were doing, he scattered them all over the place, and the building went into ruins. So back, back to this headline here, up from the ruins, that's what that means, is that the Tower of Babel, the real one, is being rebuilt right now. What does that tower represent? I want to I look at, uh, back in Genesis chapter 11, it says the whole earth was of one language and one speech. It was all about everybody united together. Come on, let's just get along. Think about what we can do together. Okay? Think about the name that we can make for ourselves. You hear this from the church, you hear this from the government, you hear this in politics, economic, you hear this everywhere. There's a call for all of us to have everything in common. Let's have a global currency. Let's have a global government. Let's, have a, let's just have one religion. That way there'll be no more religious wars. Let's just do that. And that's what they were doing back in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, if I go back to this article, okay, that talked about that. The World Trade Center's Freedom Tower to rise higher than the Empire State Building today. The owners of the One World Trade Center. I mean, there it is. Okay, It's the One World Trade Center. That's what it represents. It's a, it's a symbolic representation of rebuilding the oneness that existed before God came and confused the languages and scattered the people in Genesis chapter 11. That's, what that is. That's why that focus on the number 11 is so, so regarded here. We go back to Genesis 11 verse 6. Look at what happened here. Okay, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us uh, go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad, Upon the face of all the earth. And I want you to understand this tower and this city represents this king. That's what the tower represents. It represents a king that has been destroyed. He's put into the pit. He used to be king. Now he's destroyed. He's put in the pit. Okay? And God says, we're, not gonna, we're just going to leave him there. 
But they're going to put him all back together again and raise him back up out of the flames, out of the ashes of the fire that he went into. That's what this number 11 is all about. Go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. That's the iron kingdom that Daniel saw. And it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had, look at there, Ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them. Stop right here. Look at the language. There came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So we have these ten horns, okay? Like this, like a ten-point buck, okay? We have ten horns. And then out of the midst of those ten horns rises one more. What is that? That's... That's 11. That's who that, no, that is who that number represents. Go look in Revelation chapter 9. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 9. Here we have the, uh, the locusts coming up out of the pit. These are angels that have, that have been banished, been put in prison in the pit. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle, and on their heads was as were crowns, look at there, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Think, I want you, they're running to battle. I want you to listen to me. They're running to battle. Okay, I'm going to show you that in a minute. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, the Bible's given you a description of these, of these angels, of what they look like, and, and it's it, using symbolic language, but it's literal. This is how they look. They actually have wings. They actually have a face of men. They have hair like women. Okay? So the Bible ex will explain to you all of those symbols all throughout the Scriptures. But I want us to do something. I want us to do something interesting. I want us to count. We're going to go back, and I actually broke it down. I want you to notice that when it begins to describe these locusts, it says, number one, the shape of the locusts, like under horses. Number two, they had crowns. Number three, faces of men. Four, hair of women. Five, teeth of lions. Six, breastplates of iron. Seven, sound of their wings. Eight, tails like scorpions. Nine, stings in their tails. Ten, they had power to hurt men five months. And eleven, they had a king over them. That's also in verse 11. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And so I want you to understand this. Okay, This tower, the symbolism of a tower, it always represents this, this anti-Christ. The anti-Christ. That's... And he's being rebuilt right now. All of the nations coming together, all the markets, all the economies, all the currencies, all the people, everybody speaking the same language, everybody coming together as one, all the nations being put down. There's a fight going on right now. There's a fight going on right now where the European Union is trying desperately to muscle Great Britain to gain a stronghold in Great Britain. Great Britain is very, very, very interesting to me. Why? Is it because I love fish and chips? Well, I do. But here is why the UK, United Kingdom, this is this little theory I have. Why is England so, so important? Why? Oh, because they have a Bible. The British actually have an official monarch Bible. It's called the King James Bible. Let me give you a little lesson. Okay? Let me teach you a little something. You've heard, and let me just, let me give you a difference here. In America, in America, okay, here is the, this is the old King James. Oh, it's so confusing. I just can't understand anything it says. This, this is the new one that's taking its place. You follow me, okay? This Bible, if I open up the front page here, the Holy Bible, New King James Version, copyright 
1980, 1982 by Thomas Nelson, Inc., Nashville, Tennessee. All rights reserved. Oh, look at this. Written permission must be secured from the publisher to use or reproduce any part of this book except for brief quotations in critical reviews or articles. Are you kidding me? You don't own. You cannot, you cannot have what's in this book unless we give you permission to have it. That's what Thomas Nelson said. That's the, that's the copyright law. And see, they say it's, well, this is just, you know, just redoing the old King James. Did you know that there's actually a law that says any, any new edition that's going to be newly copyrighted and owned of a previous work must be significantly different than the work that it's based on? You see, and they went around telling everybody, it's the same, by, you, you're just an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. It's the same Bible. No, it's not. It is, it is by law significantly different than the book it was based on. Are you getting where I'm going here? Okay. Now, think about that. That's because in America and in uh, Cambodia and in Can- well, let's see, maybe not in Canada, but in South America and Africa and Well, any place in the world other than the United Kingdom. Uh, This Bible does not have a copyright on it. Did you know that I could take and I could print out every verse in this book and sell it or give it away? I don't owe anybody a dime. I I don't need their permission. I don't need anything like that. Okay? Now, that's outside of the U.K., Inside of the UK, and everybody says, "Well, I have." A, and the first time I heard this, I had a problem with this. Okay, but it's actually so wise. God, God was in charge the whole time, and I'm going to show you this. Okay, the King James Bible, 1604 to 1611, seven years, and uh, all these scholars working in cyclical fashion, reviewing so that they didn't have not have a not one person had a private interpretation over the Bible. It followed Scripture. Okay? And so here's the thing. When they presented it to King James of England, here's what he did. King James of England actually placed this Bible and the words of this Bible under something, and we don't talk like this in America. Okay? We talk like this. Well, we talk like this. Okay? But in England, they talk differently. Some of the words are this. And so it took me a while to understand this. Okay? But he placed upon the King James Bible something in English law called the Royal Letters Patent. Okay? Royal Letters Patent. And basically what this means is he did not copyright it per se in the name of King James because had he done that, then when King James died, and eventually he did, then when King James died, then, well... Who owns the Bible? Okay? It's not what he wanted. King James, God, God just really put this in his heart. Okay? King James authorized this Bible. This Bible is the words of a king spoken of in the book of Proverbs, where the words of a king of is there's power. That's what the Bible says. This was authorized by authority, by a king. And this Bible translated... And it, we call it the King James Bible because that's, that's who originated this. But he gave it the Royal's Letter Patent, or Royal Letters Patent. And here's what that means. That after King James died, the ownership of this Bible, or the patent to this Bible, went to the next one to sit on the throne after King James died. And then after that monarch passed away. It then went to the next one in line, and then it went to the next one, and then it went to the next one. So that right now, Queen Elizabeth of England, okay, rule Britannia, Queen Elizabeth of England now is the authority over the royal letters patent. And let, me, let me just kind of illustrate this for you, okay? You're going to like this. Some say, well, I have a problem with this. Cambridge and Oxford University, they are the ones who administer the rights to this Bible. 
And let me tell you what happened. A few years ago, I don't, don't remember how long ago, a few years ago, there was a lawsuit in England. Okay, The guys, I mean, they put on wigs and they go into a courtroom. There was a lawsuit. And the lawsuit was on behalf of sodomites in England. They were suing because they wanted the word sodomite taken out of the King James Bible. They said it makes us look bad. Said, should somebody tell them that sodomizing somebody makes you look bad? Kissing another man in public, that's what makes you look bad. It's not the name, it's what you're doing. That's what makes you look bad. Okay? And so anyway, the sodomites, they sued. They sued the, 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 the administrators, Oxford, Cambridge, to have the Bible changed to take that word out. They lost. You know why they lost? Because the, the people didn't own the Bible. It wasn't their Bible. It belonged to the monarch. And the monarchy said, you know what? We're just going to leave it the way it is. We're just going to leave it the way it is and not change anything. And they lost the lawsuit because unless the king says, yeah, we can change it, it doesn't change. There's a power grab going on in Europe right now. And it's targeted specifically at the United Kingdom. I wonder why. Just a theory. Okay? But anyway, they're trying to consolidate power everywhere. It's it's about it's about the um, rebuilding the tower, the new world order, the, the beast, the Antichrist. It's it's actually and I want you to get this imagery here, okay? Um, the the tower symbol is actually related to like the Masonic ladder. Um, Albert Pike talks about it here. Manley Hall talks about it. They all talk about the, the Masonic ladder. The Masonic ladder is on the earth and it goes all the way into heaven. And the idea is, is that as man climbs the steps of that ladder, he is one step at a time, he is achieving godhood. He's making his ascendancy into heaven. So it was not in Genesis 11, it was not just about building a tower and saying, look at this. It was actually about man climbing his way up into heaven by his own effort and his own hand and achieving Godhood. Okay. Now I want you to look at some verses because this is, to me, this is very, very interesting. I'm going to try to make sense out of all this. Psalm 18 verse 2, here's what the Bible says. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my who? My high tower. The Lord is my high tower. Okay? So God, Jesus Christ, is the high tower. It, it provides protection, but it's also our way to reach the heavens. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That's who he is. Look at Psalm 61, verse 3. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. And so I want you to understand this, okay? God has a plan. God has a wonderful plan of taking mankind. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that God made him a little lower than the, than the angels, and yet he's crowned him with glory. What does that mean? That God has a plan of taking mankind from way down here all the way into heaven, and it's through the tower Jesus Christ. And being in that tower not only puts us up high, which protects us from our enemies, but Christ is the one who lifts and raises us up into eternal life, literally into, into being like, like as the angels in heaven, being literally the sons of God, the way the Bible says. I absolutely love that. God is the one who did that. He, he, he's the one who built it. He's the one that made it. It's God's plan. Genesis 11 represents man saying, you know what? We can do this on our own. How many people do you know that think that they're getting to heaven on their own merit? How many people do you, how many people do you think, really? I had to explain this week. We had, a, we had an evangelist, actually a pastor, Pastor Reg Kelly, and he explained this. He said, there's two kinds of religions on the world, okay? Only two. He said there's religions based upon do and religion based upon done. And what he meant by that is 
there is a religion that is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Okay? That's done. That it's all done. It was done by Christ. Every other religion in the world is a religion of do. You do this, then you can climb. You do that, then you can have Godhood. That's what it's all. Remember what Lucifer, remember what the serpent brought Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you eat of this fruit, then ye shall become as gods. It's a do religion. It's works based. Uh, here is a graphic. Okay, I found this. I have an, I have a book on on Masonic symbols, I, and I have a lot of those. Okay, but I want you to look at this. These builders are building a tower. Okay, they're building a tower. They're using the tools of. The guys who actually build with stones and bricks. Who knows that? That's the masons. Think about it. Okay, They're using the masons' tools of the square and the compass. We've talked about that. We talked about that in the Giants videos. Freemason symbols revealed everything. They're using the tools of the square and the compass to build a man-made tower that reaches into heaven. The whole concept behind the missing piece video was the fact that rather than God making a city, rather than God making a tower, Mystery Babylon is encouraging and coaxing man to rebuild this thing for her, to represent, if the strong tower represents Christ, then there is a tower that represents, guess who? Anti-Christ. That's the representation of it. Look at back in Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. Look at that, okay? The Bible says, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. Then I want you to look down in verse 4. It says, they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. I want you to notice I have those words underlined where they said, it's exactly 46 words there. Now, you've probably watched these videos enough. You know where I'm coming from on this. Okay, 46 is the number of chromosomes where our DNA is stored. What are we hearing about now in all the news stories about DNA? Yeah, we've, we figured DNA, we're reading it like a book. It's a book that we think there needs to be some adjustments made to that book. We're going we're gonna to rebuild it. We're going to remake it. What is, what is masonry all about? Okay. You know what Albert Pike says here in 800 pages of Morals and Dogma? He says it's all about rebuilding a temple. What is a temple according to the Bible? It's the human body. 46 chromosomes where the DNA is stored. Now I want to compare that. I'm going to compare that with Genesis chapter 2. Okay, I want you to look at this. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore... Shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, again, these words that are underlined, that Adam said, exactly 46 words in the King James Bible. Now, I want you to, here's where I'm going with this, okay? I want you to notice back in Genesis chapter 11, it says, Go to, let us, let us make brick, okay? And let us do this. It's all about human Man effort. Guess who the bricks are? Guess who the hewn stones are? See, the, the, the masons, they use the square and the compass to, to, to carve out stones to make these buildings with. Okay, that's the, It's the masons' tools. That's what they're using them for. So guess what the brick of this new Tower of Babel is going to be? Guess, guess what it is? Here's a graphic. When they, when they were putting together the European Union, trying to sell it to everybody. I want you to know, this poster came out. Europe, many tongues, one voice. Look at the building that's in the back. Oh, let's stop right here. Look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 stars there. Think about it. Genesis chapter 11, the 11th horn that rises up. The 11 things and the king, the beast of 9-11, the Antichrist. That's what that's referring to. The stars, they're angels, they're angelic creatures. That's what that's referring to. But I want you to notice that we have the Tower of Babel and it's being rebuilt. See the scaffold there and the crane? They're rebuilding the Tower of Babel. But I'm going to do a close-up here. Look down at the bottom of that. Look at this next graphic. Notice that we have people... But they have like square bodies and square heads. And there we see a guy with a, with a hammer in his hand. And he's working. He's making what? He's making, see, the people 
are the bricks of the new tower of Babel. It's about humanity. We've got to build this tower with humanity. That's why we've got to collect everybody as one. If you take one brick out, I mean, the whole building could fall. So we have to have everybody in on it. We have to have everybody on it. That's why there's a, a one currency, a one religion, one government, one, one philosophy, one everything. And it has to be that way. So the idea is collectivism, socialism, communitarianism. You call it what you community. Call it what you want, but it's the idea that everybody has to be in on this or it won't work. And the bricks of the new tower are humans being reshaped and reformed by man. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10. Look at what it says. The bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. You see, there's a plan. There's a plan. The plan is that, yeah, the bricks have all fallen down. The two towers, they fell. We're going to rebuild it, but we're not going to rebuild it with bricks. Oh, no. We're going to rebuild it with what the Bible says is hewn stones. Stones that have, where stones were the masons, the men, took hammer and chisel and they square in a compass and they hewn the stone. It's the work of man is what it is. Okay, It's the work of man that's hewing out the stones that's going to build this new tower, this new world order, this, this Antichrist. When he rises up, It'll be, the, it'll be because the workmen reshaped the stones to fit the image so we could build the tower back. Are you understanding this? It says the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. Okay. Now, I want to contrast that with, I want you to notice this, Exodus chapter 20. The Bible says, If thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build, of it, build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Now, I want to stop right here. You know what God was saying here? This is Exodus 20. This is when they were gathering at Mount Sinai, and God wanted them to build an altar. And God said, now you can build an altar. But it, it, it better not be of hewn stone. You had better not lift up any tool upon that altar. And if you do, it's polluted. You know Why? God, all through the Bible, was serious about God's people understanding that the work that is to be done to redeem mankind and make him into an immortal being, according to 1 Corinthians 15, will be done by God and God alone. When you go out, when you go out, let's say you go out into nature, you go out to an old creek somewhere, and you're looking for stones, right? You're looking for stones, and you pick the rock up, the stone. Who chiseled that stone out? Let's say you go to an old creek bed. And you go pick up, I mean, you find them nice, smooth stones. Who who chiseled that stone out to make it look like that? Was it man? No. That was God. That was God that did that. Okay? Where Where did David get the stones to destroy Goliath with? Got them out of the creek bed. Five smooth stones from the river. Who, who hewed those stones. God did. The work of bringing Goliath down was the act of God, not the labor and the work of mankind. God is serious about this. Even in the building of the temple, 1 Kings chapter 6, think about it, the building of the temple. The house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer, nor an axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Tool of iron, the iron kingdom. Think about that. In fact, let's, let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Remember, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head of gold, that was crafted by man. Chest of uh, silver, crafted by man. Legs of bronze, crafted by man. And then feet of iron and clay, all pieced together by man. What is it that destroyed this image? It was a stone. What kind of stone? It was a stone cut without hands. It was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our God, is not the product of any man's philosophy or any man's work. Think about that. Why is it? I mean, let's think of the symbolism of stones. Okay? 
Here we have a stone that has had no chisel on it, no tool of man, nothing. That stone is the rock, the stone that the builders of this world rejected. They don't want that stone. Okay, It's not the work of man. It was the work of God. Think about an idol. They're made out of what? Stone. What kind of stone? They don't just go find a rock and say, it's your God. What do they do? They carve it out. That, I, that God is the work of man, and so is the religion. It is works-based. And so here back in Isaiah chapter 9, when they said, yeah, the bricks are falling down. We're going to rebuild this thing, but we're going to use hewn stone. You know what they're saying? We're going to do it just like what they said in the Tower of Babel. They used bricks. They made the bricks. It fell down. didn't work. They said, you know what? Bricks, we're not going to use them. We're going to use stone, hewn stone. We are going to carve out this thing ourselves. It is going to be the work of man. Here's an image of uh, what's called the mason's working tools. Okay, uh, You have the 24-inch gauge. You have the level. You have the... Um, uh, the plumb line, you, you have all of these. And there's, I don't want to get into all the symbolism of these tools, but there's a symbol associated with every single one of these. Okay, But basically, and, and I'm going to show you this. Here's a graphic called the rough and perfect ashlars. And I want you to notice the difference here. We have one stone that's all rough, and you can tell. I mean, you can look at this stone and tell that nature made this stone the way it is. Okay, and then you look at the one next to it, and your brain, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to look at that and say, well, uh, that one they just dug up, and that one over there, somebody worked on it. Somebody worked a long time on this, and they've made this. So here's the idea behind masonry. This, people can't handle this. Here's the idea behind masonry. Masonry says, we're making good men better. Really? That's not your job. You can't do that. Only God can do that. Okay, And so the idea of the rough versus the smooth ashlar is that the rough ashlar represents man as he is now. Well, hang on a second. Who made man? God did. And so masonry says we have to use our tools and we have to hew out the man. We're going to rebuild him and we're going to make him perfect. We're going to make him Square, that's what all that is, okay? We are going to do this. Not God. We're going to do this. And that's what that's what this tower represents. The bricks fell down, so we're going to rebuild it with hewn stones. But not only that. They said the sycamores are cut down. We'll just change them into cedars. Okay? We don't, we don't like the sycamores. We'll change them into cedars. Cedars. That's an interesting, uh, interesting symbol in the Bible. Because in Ezekiel 31, verse 3, we noted this in our video on the giants. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick bows. The, uh, the Assyrian. You know who that, you know what that's the name for the Antichrist. That's one of the names in the Bible for the Antichrist, the Assyrian. And notice that he is a cedar, and notice that he is of high stature, like one of the giants, the hybrids. Notice Amos chapter 2, verse 9. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was strong as the oaks yet, I, oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. See that? From above and his roots from beneath. Did you see what God said? As above, so below. He said, I destroyed it once. The, the Amorite before them whose height was like the height of the cedars. Here we have the giants. Okay, And we have the Assyrian, named for the Antichrist, typified as a cedar. We have the Amorite, typified as a cedar. We have them rebuilding, rebuilding the tower, rebuilding the building. The bricks came down, hewn stone. The sycamores are cut down. We're going to change them into cedars. Think about it. It's a representation of the Antichrist. Now, I want you to look at this. Okay, here's, here's, why, here's why I'm going into such detail to tell you all this. And why, why is it that this tower had to reach, had to become the king of all the towers on April the 30th, the 121st day of the year? And this is why it matters to you. 
because it's about the rebuilding of Babylon the Great. It's about the, the regathering of all the pieces to put together the Antichrist. It's about a king that's about ready to rule on planet Earth. And I want you to look at what the Bible says. Ezekiel chapter 33. Look at this. This is the ministry now of the watchman. Ezekiel 33, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast, and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth, look at here, the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet, that's the Bible, and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. And so here God says, watchman, you're watching. God trains his watchmen to know what to see. God's, I mean, this is why I've read uh, Dan Brown and read all these books. I mean, why? They were tra- God was teaching me. God was teaching me how the devil looks, what he does when he does it, how the enemy works. So I've, been, I've just been in training. Not everybody's cut out for this. Not everybody's interested in it. But God has made me... I just, I want to know. I look at this symbol on this Bible and I'm going, I want to know what that means. I want to know. So God has trained me into knowing this. Why? Because the farther away that I can spot the enemy, the better off the people behind the wall will be. I give them long enough warning so that they can be ready on the day of battle. What day of battle is that? Jeremiah chapter 20. I want you to notice what God says. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the what? The sword of their enemies. And thine eyes shall behold it, and I will give all Judah into the hand of who? Look there, the king. The king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them. Look at there shall slay them with the sword. Let me tell you something. Okay? When this new world order comes into power, it will be done, it will be done at the edge of a sword. There is going to be a war. There are going to be wars and rumors of wars exactly the way Jesus told that the world the likes of which the world has never ever seen. Okay? That's what's going to happen. The building of the new world order, the new kingdom of Babylon, the king of Babylon, who's the Antichrist, when he comes into power, it will be done so by the power of the sword, which means warfare, killing people. Babylon is coming again. The watchmen who are assigned to the wall should be out there sending warning in advance, letting people know, hey, I'm watching them build this tower. I know what that means. I know what's coming after that. And I'm telling you that, you know what? They, they're going to say, well, you're crazy. Well, just give them the video. If you can't explain it like I just did, give them this video. Give them some of the others that we have. Give them Bible tracts with King James Bible verses in it. Let the seed of the Word of God go into their life. Yeah, they're going to think you're crazy. They thought Noah was crazy, didn't they? Okay? They thought Elijah was Something wrong with him. John the Baptist, look how he's dressed. Look what he eats. You can't take him seriously. And John the Baptist was just simply him, trying to tell him, look, repent, the kingdom of God is at, at hand. It's close. Get ready. That's what he was trying to do. They thought he was crazy. And yet there were some that heeded the warning. I see a beam go up, lower Manhattan, on April 30th, 2012. And I know what that means. I can't just not tell everybody because you might think I'm nuts. I'm going to try to do the best job that I can to logically show you exactly what this means. And you know what? If I'm wrong, too bad. Stinks to be me. But if I'm right and I've sounded the trumpet and you have too, and the sword comes because it is coming, whether you believe that a beam shows that or not, the sword is coming. Are you ready for that day? God is not going to get any 
glory out of the death of the wicked. It's not what he's interested in. He wants you to turn from your ways. Will you turn, oh, backsliding America? Will you turn? This is Pastor Mike. I, I've got more here. I don't have time to get into it today. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about indulgences and reprogramming your DNA. We'll save it for next week. All right, this is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.